you have to understand what that project is worth to your client. Business of Architecture, episode 287. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears and I am your host on this show where you'll discover tips and strategies for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. In this episode, I'm actually being interviewed and I'm speaking with Alex Gore. Al Gore is one of the co-hosts of the popular Inside the Firm podcast. If you haven't already checked that podcast out, I encourage you to go over and subscribe. But Alex reached out to me when he heard that I was relaunching my popular Profit Levers course. And in this interview, we go over some of the profit levers that can help you instantly increase your bottom line and your profit in your architecture firm. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Alex Gore. Without further ado, let's jump right into it. So hey, this is Alex here with Enoch. How's it going? Alex is going excellent, man. Good to hear from you. Yeah. So you have an email series that I'm pretty interested in and um, also a course that people can probably get to uh, through the email series called Profit Levers. And I have a couple questions and I actually want to go sort of behind the scenes um, inside your firm, inside how you do it. But first, could you give everyone an overview of what this is. Sure. Well, let's, let's back up a couple of steps here, Alex, because there's a conversation in architecture when we talk about money, right? And there's this conversation that somehow money is not important, that I don't do what I do for the money. Right. Well, that's ridiculous, but <laughs> yeah. It may be ridiculous, but I know that I have thought that in the past. And that doesn't mean that I don't understand that money is part of a larger picture. Yeah. Right. That doesn't mean that I don't understand that money is something necessary. It's a medium of exchange and to have a fantastic business to be able to win in the game of design and architecture. We need to master the game of business and the business, the language of business is money. Yeah. Right. Yep. And I mean, even nowadays, I mean, look, we can even say, oh, it's not only money, it's also social and environmental impact, right? So there's some companies out there, they're doing some really cool things in terms of this triple bottom line accounting, right? Which is we're not just judging our company based upon the profit and loss of the dollars or the, the rands or the pounds or whatever, but we're actually looking at the social environmental impact we have, right? So that conversation aside, I'm not going to be addressing that. I think that's a valid way to approach business. That's fantastic. But when we're talking about business people, businessmen and businesswomen who are understanding and winning in business, it's because there's one key metric that they're looking at to judge whether they're being successful or not. Yep. Um, and that is money. Yeah. So I, I want to relay a quick story because it relates exactly to what you're talking about. So I was telling you before we got in the air that we have one big project that's trying to do something really cool, some great design. And it was something that wasn't in the initial scope. But it was in the scope in the sense of, hey, we're doing a building for you. And we said that we we're going to do this building for you. But it's a very intricate piece of architecture that we're going to have to design. And what is that going to take? More money. So I had to have that conversation with the client. And it worked out well. And, you know, we'll get paid more. But I came back to the office. And there was another one of our employees uh, working with another big project. And it wasn't about the design, but it was all these issues, all these questions coming up. And I could see, you know, it, it, he was kind of getting, I wouldn't say flustered, but it's a lot to handle, right? And the talk that I had with him is that, okay, what we're trying to give them is value. And value and money can be interchangeable because that's going to time and your time is relating to money. So for our staff to give people the appropriate amount of time, give them the appropriate number of, of responses, coordination and value takes money. If, if I don't manage my money well, all of a sudden I'm pressuring myself or my staff to not do a good job, right? To not make good architecture. And if that isn't all managed well, we can't do what we do, but also the clients can't do what they actually want to do. That's right. I mean, it, you can't meet your mission if you're not making money. Yep. Yep. I remember I remember seeing this this blog post once about how you can actually look it up. You can Google it. You can look up a Mother Teresa, you know, is bad or she's a scam or something because this person wrote this article was going off about how Mother Teresa was just this big financial operation because she did, man. She actually had a lot of money flowing through her organization, right? But she needed the money to be able to have the impact that even Mother Teresa had. 
right? Yeah. And so somehow we live in this myth, we live in this fantasy world that in architecture, all I need to worry about is design. Look, here's another story. So a couple of years ago, I was at the AI conference and I had a chance to sit down with Tom Main because he had just won the AI gold medal, right? Awesome, Mark. And I was asking about this conversation of business and architecture. I said, Tom, I said, tell me about your approach to business and architecture. And he kind of like, he kind of like laughed and scoffed. He said, well, you, you've seen my you know, you know about me, right? You know what I do. I'm like, yes, yes, I know. You know, you're all about the design and everything, right? And so he just began to expound about his design decisions and why they do what they do and what it represents in the world and all this stuff we get really excited about as architects. But here's the key. There was a little sideline that he said when we were discussing this that my ears perked up because you know, he's all, you know, through it all, I've had a great support. My wife has been my business manager. Yep. So did you hear, I, I'm sure we talked, I mean, we've been on each other's podcasts. We've known, we've even met in person, but I told you, I worked at Daniel Leapskin. And if you know anything about his firm, guess who was managing the money? His wife. And his wife was the one at the bank when he was trying to get a loan to do the Jewish museum. And, you know, he was talking about design, obviously, and, and how cool it was going to be. And she, she finally had to interject and said, no, no, you can loan us this money because we have a contract. And that contract has this amount and, you know, laid everything out so the banker could understand and like, okay, you can have your loan now, you know, to, start, <laughs> to run your firm. So absolutely. I mean, that, that, that is a brilliant ideal uh, idea and a brilliant example, Alex, of this idea that somehow we exist. We almost, we, we abide by this myth in the architecture industry, right? That money isn't important, that these successful architects who are doing these world-class projects that, you know, they're just in it for the design, they're just doing good design. No, behind every single successful firm, you have someone that is managing the funds like a hawk and understands the keys of business. So what happens to small firms, right? When we don't realize what's really happening behind the curtains, of these very prominent world-class firms, we know that the, the leaders of the firms are out there talking about how it's all about design, it's all about design, and that's what they focus on, right? We get this picture that success means I just have to be a good architect. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to actually my first question, because there's this veil, right? And you have put together a system, a course, that kind of uh, gives people a peek into it. But what I want to know is, how did you come up with this system? What did you have to do to kind of understand this better and communicate this better to people? Sure. So the first idea is getting over my own misconceptions that, you know, somehow money is not important. Right. And I was on a webinar just earlier today presenting to about 50 different architects from around the U.S. And one of the comments in the chat box, we were kind of discussing this idea of lead generation marketing for an architecture firm. And one of the architects said, well, you know what? Relationships are more important to us than money. Hmm. Why are the relationships important? <laughs> well, that's the point. I mean, like, okay, great. Go out to, there's a place here in Visalia, California called the Oval. And there's this, the homeless people hang out in the Oval right? So, you know, you can probably have some real great relationships with those homeless people if you go out there and just hang out all day and, you know, just start giving them money. They'll probably like you for a little bit. Yeah. Right. So ultimately your question is exactly the right question we should be asking, right? It's like, ultimately it's going to go back to money. Yes, we value relationships. And I get what this architect was trying to say. He was trying to say, look, we don't compromise our relationships for money. That's probably what he was trying to get at. And obviously that's a winning strategy. That's what we want to do. But at the same time, I know there's the subtext that like, if I focus on money, then I have to be all about the money because we see the wolf of Wall Street and everything like that, right? So to go back to your question, Enoch, how did you come up with this? How did you uncover this? Well, you know, years ago when I first started back in 2011 or whatever, when I first started business of architecture, I like you wanted to discover these principles of business, right? Because I noticed that there's certain patterns of success in business. Al, that basically people can follow them and it leads inevitably to success, right? Now, within that framework of patterns of success in business, there's a lot of variability in the way that our personalities work, in the way that we see the world, and the way that we achieve that end. But there are constants, right? You can look at people that are ultra successful like Mother Teresa, and you can look at other people maybe who are successful in business like, uh, you know, like, um, like Jeffrey, Jeff Bezos. Sure, right? yeah. And you can say, okay, two very different ends, but I bet there's common parallels between things they did to have success. So when I took a look at, at architects in general, and I'm thinking about how to get our, how to help architects get to the next level, because that's my goal and my mission is really to raise the industry and to help architects achieve abundance in three key areas. I call them the three F's. Number one would be 
their fulfillment, right? Because at the end of the day, we need to be fulfilled. Number two is freedom, right? And this may, this may mean freedom in terms of the kind of products we have to work on, uh, the kind of clients we get to work with, and the time we can take off. And then lastly, finances, right? But we need to have all three of these things. And this is what I find that most firm owners define as success. Heck, if I can be fulfilled, if I can be financially abundant, and if I can have freedom, then I've created my dream practice, right? Yeah. And so I said, okay, cool. I want to get people there. What are some of the first things they need to do? Well, when I look at architecture firms, both the ones that I work with that are in the programs I, I, I run, um, or just the firms that I interview, right? The one key thing is that they need profit to be able to invest in marketing and business development, right? Because that's the number one problem and challenge I have is I wish I had better clients to work with. I, be, I wish I had better projects, right? But they don't understand how to get there. Well, the key is that it takes an enormous amount of investment. It takes money to acquire clients, right? Now, if you look at the firms that get referrals year after year after year, it's because they've spent years building up a book of business through relationships. There's a value to that. They've spent lots of time, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars building those relationships, right? So to be in this idea that, that all I need to do is wait for referrals, that like I don't do any marketing because clients are free, is a mistaken fallacy that is hurting architecture firms around the world because they're not understanding that to really grow and get consistency to your practice, you need to be able to afford on marketing and business development for your firm, right? So this idea of profit levers, I'm thinking, okay, Alex, business is a complex topic. There's a lot of things we could implement in a firm. When we look at a firm and we want to get them to the next level, we could invest in repositioning the firm. We can invest in looking at strategic partners. We could look at trying to get them press in some leading magazines to increase their brand profile and their visibility, right? But I want to say, okay, cool. What are the very, what are the quick wins that even the smallest of sole practitioners could implement quickly in their practice to just change things they're already doing? If I just change the way that I'm doing this, it can have a significant impact on my bottom line, give me more profit. I can then reinvest that profit back into marketing and business development. And then I can start to dominate my local market because now I have the $30,000 website. Now I have the amazing videos because I can afford to do that. Right. And then that's a virtuous cycle that leads to better projects and better clients. So in terms of the individual profit levers, Alice, I was just looking at what are some easily easy to implement things that people could do. Like that's why they're called a lever, right? You basically pull down one end and if it's, if the fulcrum's over there, it can move this very large boulder, right? So that's the idea behind a profit lever. What are some things that we can do that are simple to implement that give an extraordinarily outsized result? Yeah. One thing that I want to make sure that I get across because I think it's so important is that this is not the first course you've ever done. This is not your, your first day. And what that means is not that you necessarily, you know, have all the experience and all the answers, but because that you are a business person and you want to make money for yourself, you've honed your system. So you've had things develop over time and you've tried this out with people that you've taught and those people have had success. And because they've had success then you're able to either repackage it, make a new one and, and give it to more people. If it didn't work, I wouldn't be talking to you because you wouldn't have the time <laughs> to talk to me because you'd have to be go making money some other place. So could you tell me about, I, I kind of have two questions and you can answer it any way you want. Either, you know, someone who did a specific thing and it worked for them or what are the type of people that this either works for or this doesn't? What do those type of people do? Because I, I teach at the university level and I can tell you, hey, students who do this, they are the ones that succeed. Students who do this do not succeed. So take, take that question any way you want, but um, I wonder if you could give some insight into the actual real people. Sure, you bet. So there's, there's a lot of patterns in terms of the second part of that question, which is what are the patterns of people that do that succeed? I mean, that's a big question. So maybe we can circle back on that. In terms of the examples of things that, that I've seen firms do that, that have produced these outsized results, I'll give you a couple examples, right? So one, one of the profit levers is, well, let, let's go with this. What about I share with, your, with our audience and those people listening a profit lever today that could instantly, literally the next time they send out an invoice could instantly double their profit. How does that sound? Great. Or, or 10X their profit. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So this is a simple thing, but interestingly about this, there's a lot of psychological hangups that keep people from implementing this profit lever. And when I say it, people are going to think, oh, you know, come on, that's so simple. That's, that's you know. That's common sense, right? But here's the key. 
I'm talking about raising your fees. Okay. So if you want to instantly put more money in the bank, go and add 10% to your fees. What does that 10% do? Well, let's just take an example. Let's just say for round numbers that you're currently charging $100 an hour. Sure. Right? And let's say that you go ahead and you increase to $110 an hour, right? On the face of that, you might say, okay, cool. I'm making $10 more an hour, which is about 10% of $100, right? However, let's just say that currently your firm's operating at a almost a zero or 5% profit margin, right? So let's say that off of that, off of that $100, you were banking about $5 in profit. When you add that 10% onto it, so now you've gone up to $110, you've basically doubled your profit. You have doubled your profit. You've multiplied your profit by 200% by raising your fees. Yeah, amazing. And is a client really going to say, well, uh, this guy's 10% less, let's, you know, I'm sorry. I mean, most of them aren't going to notice it, right? So that's one example, Al, of a profit lever. And yes, do we have examples of architects that have done this? Yes. The ones that go through the program, I teach them how to do this. I show them, hey, look, we're going to, you know, now I don't dictate the fees. I'm not like, you know, we're going to be price fixing here, right? But what, what this is about, it's about this conversation of understanding that you can charge much higher fees once you understand. Here's the thing. When you're looking at how to price a project, right? So many times they get, you know, hey, Enoch, how am I supposed to, you know, how do you suggest we do our fees, right? Well, architects, they do, you know, they do fixed fees. They may take a look at how many sheets it takes to do the job and kind of price it out that way. But here's what I'm going to recommend. And you can go listen to my interview with Blair Enns on the Business of Architecture podcast for more about this. Blair says, and I agree with him completely, price the client, not the project. Okay. Now here's the key. You have to understand what that project is worth to your client. Oh, okay. So it's a different way of looking at the fee. You're not, you're no longer looking at this is how long it takes us and stuff, but you're actually looking, okay, what is this project worth to my client? And then we base our fee based upon that. Yep. And okay. you were talking about, I almost misunderstood um, pricing the client as, oh, this is a rich guy versus this guy's medium wealth or, you know, this girl has this much money. It's not them. It's almost price the, what the project will do for them. Exactly. Thank you for clarifying that, Alex. That's right. What we're doing is we're understanding clearly. It doesn't matter how much, how wealthy this client is. We're not going to upcharge them just because we think they have a huge budget because they're not going to buy that, right? They're going to say, well, get out of town, you know, but we need to understand clearly what the project can do for them. Right. Yep. And if it's a homeowner, it's going to be something emotional, most likely. If it's a business, it's going to be something financially based. And then we need to understand that to set our fee. Right. So once we start to understand that way of looking at our fees, it helps us deconstruct. And then you know what? It's not that big of a deal to add 10% to our fee because realistically, if we're like making this company a million dollars or like you t- you're doing a multifamily project now, right? So you're talking about, you were telling me before this call, you can do some really cool design with the balconies and just have a lot of fun. Sounds like you're absolutely crushing it, you know? Well, the reason those developers continue to come back to you is because you give them a positive ROI, right? And what's an extra $50,000 in their budget? I mean, really at the end of the day, it's, it's a decimal place. Yeah, right. especially when you get on, on those large numbers. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was looking through your, your course and what you're offering and, you know, I know prices change, um, just because, you know, sometimes you're doing a promotion, some, you know, it might be a semi different course next year. So the, the price that I saw, I don't, five years ago, 10 years ago when I was just starting, you know, like I wanted to do some of these things. And now that I'm older and I kind of know how things work, when I see these prices, I go, this is a steal. This is a steal of a deal. It, and, and because I teach, you know, students, it's, you know, sometimes we'll get in discussions about what to do, what not to do. And a lot of times we afford a lot of um, flexibility, especially creativity in what they do. But sometimes it comes down to try it my way unless you have a way better idea. And then I go, you won't know if you have a way better idea until you try it my way first and then see it against your idea, right? So for your course, if – I almost want to guarantee it, but I'm not making any money off of your course. I almost want to guarantee if you just listen to what he said and just tried it first and just, you know, got out of your own head and said, no, I'm just going to try this. There's no way you want to 10 X the amount of money that you put into paying this for this. 
Like I just see, I, I saw your whole outline and I was like, this is, this is a no brainer, <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I, yeah, I want to encourage people to, yeah. Did you have something? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love the way you're thinking about this, Alex. You're, you're really resonating with me because you're thinking about it like a businessman. And this is so important because it's a mindset. It's not about how much something costs. It's about the investment and what it can do for my business. Mm-hmm. Right. And this is where architects, a lot of times when we get so much, when we, when, because it, one of my mentors recently told me, he, he said, you know what, Enoch, he said, there's two ways to look at growing a business. Number one, you can look at how much things cost or you can look at it from an investment standpoint is what is this going to do for my business? Right. Yeah. When we look at 2008, the companies that died were the companies that pulled back on marketing because it cost money. Right. And so what happened to them? It's like they basically cut off the hose to the plant. The plant withered and died. Right. So I love the fact, yeah, the, the program itself that I'm offering here. Um, yeah, it's an incredible deal. There's a hundred percent money back guarantee. So actually anyone that joins the course, if they don't make their money back, they can, you know, I try to make it a no brainer, but more importantly here, it's like, well, Enoch, if these, if these things are so great, why don't you just give it away for free? You know, why don't you let people just get these profit levers for free? Well, there's a couple reasons. There's a couple reasons for that, Alex. And number, the number one reason is if we're not willing to pay someone else to get a result in our life, then we're not going to be able to charge someone else to give them a result. Yep. Right. You've probably experienced that in your life. Well, I, I think there's, yeah, there's an, there's a, I didn't even think about that reason. I, I, I thought about the other reason where, um, the, what I was getting at with one of the questions is the people who succeed are the ones that actually execute. The execution is what matters. And if you're not putting some skin in the game, you're, you're definitely not going to execute. I know for a fact, there's people that have bought this. So I teach Revit, shout out to Revit rocket ship. You can go there and buy the course. And I know people that buy it and don't use it. <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What are you going to get from that? You know? So I, I bet you there's a couple people that buy your course and honestly don't use it. They buy it because it's obviously a good idea. They're going to use it some other time. Maybe get, they get too busy or whatever, but it ties into the, if, if you, if you just execute, it's going to be worth it for you. You know? Dude, totally. And you remind me, here's another crazy thing. Cause a lot of times I see architects, they want to compete on price. They want to say, look, I'm going to lower my, I feel like I'm in this price rat race that I got to go to the bottom. Right. And there's this mistaken fallacy that if we give something away for free, people will value us. Or if we devalue our services that people will value us. Right. I learned this very early on as a father, when I bought my son, this beautiful, nice new mountain bike. Right. So I spent money and I gave it to him as a gift, you know, one week later, that thing was sitting out in the rain, rusting. Okay. Compare that to when I was a kid, I had a paper route and I saved up my money. And I still remember the day when I walked in to the sporting goods store and I was able to purchase with my own money. It was like $300 at the time, which was like a huge fortune. Oh yeah. Wow. Uh, back yeah. Then. <laughs> you're not old, but you're not that young either. I'm so. not, you know, and, and this was a, it was a red Bianchi mountain bike. And I still remember it sitting there on the showroom floor. And you better believe that I took care of that bike because I had paid so much money for it, right? So here's, here's the deal, right? If people buy my course and they don't do it, it's probably because I didn't charge them enough. Because yeah. value, the way we value something is almost directly related to how much sacrifice that we took to actually get that thing. And so it's, it's in our best interest, a lot of, as counterintuitive as it sounds, sometimes it's our, been in our best interest to charge our clients a lot of money because they value it more. Here's, here's a, a secret that I've learned from a lot of very high-end residential architects that I work with. Uh, they say, you know what, Enoch, the clients who I charge the most money to, and I'm talking about these are $10 million plus homes. Mm-hmm. They're the easiest clients to work with. They value me the most. And it's the ones that are coming in and wanting to nickel and dime me and wanting to pay the cheapest price. Those are the ones that don't value me and are the problem clients. I couldn't agree. <laughs> More than 100% because 100% is a limit. I can tell you story after story that mimics that. I, I just reasonably upped the fee because we did something outside the scope for um, a client. And it's not like they're you know, the richest person in the, in the world at all. But it was I'm it's concise but very laid out email. No problem sending a check tomorrow. Another client where we're doing a lot of work, actually more than, you know, what we're getting paid for, but it was, hey, lower the fee. You know, it was in one of those tight periods. 
holy cow, it, it just the opposite. It, it's like pulling teeth and it's crazy how true that statement is. And isn't that weird though, how counterintuitive it is though? I mean, before you got into business, I would have had no idea before I got into business, but it just seems counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because the, the high price, you almost think in your head, they're going to demand so much more. And, you know, maybe the quality of design, maybe the materials, maybe some of the communication, but the, the, you don't think about the opposite is true. Someone who's looking for a deal is going to want something more also. They're still in every instance looking for more attention, more detail. So both of them are looking for it in your theory. You know, in your theory, both of them are going to want, you know, you know, more value. But the person that's trying to nickel and dime it down is actually the one that's going to normally be more harassing about it. Totally. Because if you think about a, think about an ultra wealthy person, right? If they have enough money, they have more money than time generally is what you're going to find. And so the last thing they want to do, they want you to take care of everything. They're like, man, Alex, just take care of it for me. You know, here's some money, just go make it happen. You know, Um, they're not going to be like, oh man, I was on the job site yesterday and and that the tile wasn't exactly the right shade. And, and, you know, I I saw it cheaper at Home Depot. Uh, Why did the contractor charge us this much money for the tile? You know, you're just like driving me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how can people just start to get acquainted with this? Um, right. well, what, I, what I recommend is that I've set up an email series that goes over three distinct profit levers. And in these emails that I've set up, Alex, it basically teaches them and shows them how they can use these profit levers. And there's some case studies of firms that, that implemented three of these profit levers. Uh, it's an email series that I've provided. Yeah. And someone just goes to the webpage. I'll give you a link here. It's ARC Resources, A-R-C-H, resources.org. So it's not .com or anything, arcresources.org forward slash profit dash levers with an S. So if they go there, there's a page where they can just enter in their email address and then they'll get those emails and they'll get those three profit levers. And then if they want to invest in the program now, it is closed right now as we're doing this interview, but I'm going to pay attention to who, who drops into that landing page and then I can open it up for a little bit to give them the opportunity to join that. Because right now I'm literally working with clients uh, who are going through the program. Tomorrow I have a call we're, we're focused on profit lever number one right now. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Hey, thanks for uh, stopping in and talking about it. And uh, if, if people aren't following you, they can business of architecture is, is your podcast. Is it business of architecture.com? Yeah. Just go to business of architecture.com. You can create a free account there. There's a number of free resources that I give away. And um, when you sign up for a free membership, including what I call the profit map a video, how to double your architecture from income in the next 12 months. So there's a video that goes over that. Also, you'll get access to my, the digital copy of social media for architects and a few other things. Just go to businessofarchitecture.com. There's a link to create an account, create an account, and then you'll be able to follow my world and would love to have you over there. Perfect. Sounds great. All right. I'm, I'm sure we will hear from you and we mentioned you randomly every, let's say five or so episodes just because it comes up. Um, but again, it was good, good uh, reaching out and connecting. Awesome. Alex, thanks, man. Carpe diem. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.